yeah so meeting is in recording so uh, in today's webinar we have the parent labs uh, uh, parent is a hyperlayer labs project and uh, is contributed by the boss and uh, there is a another german company so let me polycrypt yeah polycrypt this this is this is the agenda so in this webinar you will have getting hands on the piran estate channels uh, which is a hyperledger less project and we have mathis yes software architect for the polycrypt and mano ji software engineer at boss and so this is a uh, kind of contribution to the hyperledger less and in this session uh, we will cover the uh, basic about the piran estate channels and uh, getting hands on and how the iot could be integrated with the this pen structures so yeah over to you mathis and yeah, others okay hello all uh, uh, good morning good afternoon uh, so i'll just uh, share my screen you can see if it once it's visible is my screen visible now yeah it looks good yeah, okay yeah welcome you all to this uh, talk uh, in this talk uh, myself uh, i am manoranjit i work at bosch as software engineer and i have my colleague here uh, matias who works at uh, polycrypt gmbh in germany uh, so we will together be presenting uh, you on our approach towards uh, scaling problem in blockchain uh, which is which we call it peron and uh, the background of or premise of this work is uh, the observation that uh, it is very expensive to do uh, transactions on chain now for example if you look at the uh, transaction throughput of ethereum it's roughly around 15 or 15 to 20 transactions per second or uh, and it takes quite a long amount of time in order of minutes so 5 minutes or so and costs are also uh, too high yeah, too high in the sense that it does not allow many applications like you want to go to shop buy something and pay for it with uh, cryptos then it's not possible because the transaction cost and confirmation times are not uh, suitable for that also you can see uh, the graph on the right uh, which shows the gas price over time for ethereum so gas price is like how you how you pay for your costs on ethereum blockchain and this is also fluctuating which means uh, the cost of transaction is also not stable uh, so this actually makes uh, blockchains insufficient for uh, many use cases Uh, for example uh, you want to do as i said for day to day trading if you want to buy something and then uh, pay for it with cryptos it's uh, difficult or if you want to do say micro payments uh, so you want to do a large number of uh, small payments over small amount of time then also this is not possible or uh, same goes for high frequency trading so uh, so we thought uh, we will come up with some solution to address this problem also one of the more uh, particular and special premise that we want to focus on is uh, industrial iot use cases so in industrial iot we actually have a range of devices uh, such as a car, car to uh, car charger uh, transactions or you are using any uh, tool that is very expensive and uh, you like you are renting the tool for usage and then using it and paying for it or within a uh, like a factory where many people share a shared shop floor where there are uh, machines from different companies if you want to make transaction between these two machines so these are certain use cases that we are looking at and in these kind of use cases if you see there are uh, three properties one uh, the transaction value and frequency so the tra transaction value is a uh, very small uh, because you want to uh, ensure that you are taking little risk so for example if you are charging for one hour maybe you will not pay upfront for one hour but you will pay for uh, every minute for the energy that you consume and so you have a low value transaction and these transactions need to be done at high frequency uh second is the connectivity aspect so when we talk about internet of things we have a range of devices some like that are always connected to the cloud like highly connected devices uh, some are residing in some local network like a company vpn or a corporate network such that they cannot access the direct internet but have a limited accessibility a third set of devices could be that uh, they do not have internet access at all 
but they're able to talk to some parent device and through that get some internet access. For example, you can think of your smartwatch. Most smartwatches don't have internet access, but they uh, do get data from internet through your mobile phone. So we have a range of connectivity options that we should support. And the third is the resource constraints. So in most cases, IoT devices are uh, tailored towards uh, certain use cases and uh, their uh, computing power and memory are mostly uh, confined only to that use case. So we do not have the option to have a large code footprint. Code footprint. So we also need our solution to have uh, a very minimal code print on the device side. So this is a background on which we uh, base our work on. Uh, I'll hand over to Matthias, who will explain uh, how we, uh, the Perun protocol is, what it is, and how it works, and how it addresses these constraints that I've described. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, let me try to explain a bit how the technology works at a high level, and then also uh, go into detail what we implemented and how the Perun framework looks like in terms of implemented components and how you can use it, and Manu will then go even more into detail and show you a demo. So how does the technology work at a, at a high level? The goal is because transactions on the layer one on the blockchain itself, which is the upper part, are costly, we want to shift as much of the transactions to the layer two, which is an off-chain part, and this is a direct communication between two potential clients. So now when they uh, these two clients now decide to open such an off-chain uh, channel. They have to transmit an on-chain deposit and open the channel by that. So there is one on-chain transaction for opening the channel. And now once the channel is open, they can transact basically with the same security guarantees as on the uh, layer one, as if they were transacting on the blockchain. But now they can do it peer-to-peer -peer with the Perun channel technology and there are basically no transaction costs because you're transacting off-chain and you basically have no transaction limits in terms of throughput or uh, confirmation times because as soon as you agree on a new state off-chain, basically this just involves two signatures by both parties, then the transaction is confirmed. And once you're happy with the off-chain state, let's say after uh, a few transactions, then you can decide to register your state on the blockchain and then it will be materialized on the public blockchain again and your funds will be available once you settle the registered state. So this is the general idea. So all the basic transactions or the, uh, the valuable transactions will go to the second layer and only opening and settling the channel will be on the blockchain itself. And the important part is that our protocols guarantee that this happens with the same security guarantees as if you were uh, transacting directly on the blockchain, almost the same security guarantees. You also get some uh, cer uh, certain level of privacy for your transaction because the blockchain will not see how many transactions you did and what amount was there. They will all, the blockchain will only see the end result. And furthermore, this allows us to do some interesting other um, um, yeah, uh, apply to some interesting other use cases where maybe client one, so Alice here, for example, on the left side, and Bob is the client two on the other side, and they may actually sit on different blockchains. So Alice may, may be on a, a Ethereum blockchain, and Bob may be on a Hyperledger uh, blockchain on a Hyperledger Fabric, and uh, they can still open the channel with this technology. So this is a pretty cool side effect of, of this technology. Yeah, with that, I think then, um, of course, our one of our challenges in the project, especially uh, in the use case that Bosch is addressing, is that we want to port it to the IoT uh, use case that Manu was, um, was explaining, was describing. And this means now our clients are not uh, human users, but they may be machines such as a car and a charger. So the car wants to pay the charger in small amounts, depending on how much it charges. And the car might not be direct, uh, directly connected to the blockchain, uh, but it may be connected to a node which acts on behalf of it and has the blockchain connection. So these are some abstractions uh, that we need to implement in order to make this technology work for this IoT use case. 
Um, so concretely, what does the framework consist of at the moment? Uh, so here we want to give you an overview. At the core, we have this. Includes the, the core protocol logic. Then we have an implementation of a, a Ethereum smart contracts for running this protocols on the Ethereum blockchain. And clients can either, if they are uh, have a lot of resources, they can run uh, directly using uh, the state channel SDK, the GoPerun library, or if they are light clients, they can use the Peru node, which was developed particularly by Bosch, uh, to make light clients work and make the burden, uh, the, basically the connect, connect re, yeah, remove some of the connectivity um, requirements from the clients and also take some lo additional load from the clients to connect um, to the blockchains. And this is what the, what the Peru node achieves. And uh, one, I think, important aspect of our uh, library, of the core library, how we decided is that we decided with modularity in mind. So um, we have designed the components of our library, which is a blockchain interface, a persistence interface, a network interface, and a logging interface in an abstract way so that the core logic of the, of the framework, the protocol logic, does not depend on any specific implementation or any specific blockchain, but it only depends on this very abstract interface. And this allows us to either plug in uh, a Ethereum blockchain, but also you could plug in a Hyperledger uh, fabric blockchain. And the same goes for the persistence, the logging and the network layer. So you can either plug in a simple TCP IP socket dialer, or you can plug in a lib P2P uh, dialer, which uh, gives you additional connectivity options. So this is a, a core feature of our framework, how we designed it. And I think this is uh, it from my part. And now Manu will go a bit more into detail what uh, they have been implementing uh, for the Bosch use case. Yeah. Yeah, as uh, Matthias had explained before, uh, the node of uh, the implements the core state channel logic, like uh, the Perun SDK implements the core state channel logic, and node on top of that uh, provides some uh, user-facing functionalities. For example, if you need to, uh, if there are two people, Alice and Bob, and they need to talk to each other, uh, they should know who they are. Their identity should be confirmed. So you need some mechanism to get how to contact them off-chain and what is their on-chain address and things like that. So for that, we have a component called off-chain identity provider. So uh, this component uh, provides the identity of whom you're interacting with, and it can source the identity from different so, uh, places. For example, currently we use a simple file where you put all the uh, details in a file and then provide it to the node. But this can also be an external service, say uh, some identity service or even some identity-based blockchain like uh, uh, Hyperledger Indy, which pr provides an SI-based networks. Uh, second is key handling. Uh, so for creating signatures on the states uh, that are created by the SDK, we need to uh, use some kind of wallet uh, that can be like a local Ethereum wallet, a key store wallet, or an external uh, service again. So those kind of functionalities are, are offered by the key handling module. And on top of that, we provide a session. So the session kind of manages all the channels belonging to the user and manages the state of it so that the user uh, need not maintain any state. He can just uh, interact with what information he has. So on top of that, we provide a user API, uh, which kind of is an easy way to uh, interact with the node and uh, the clients uh, interact with the node through the user API. Uh, if we get just uh, one step uh, deeper, uh, what we do is that uh, in the user session, uh, we still uh, keep the channels as generic state channels. So you can implement any kind of logic. If you want game channels, uh, then you can implement uh, the game logic or uh, the payment channels, what we will show later in the demo that also can be implemented. And on top of that, in the user API, uh, we have an app-specific API, uh, which actually uh, just translates. This uh, user API does not maintain any state, but it just translates uh, what the generic state is to that application-specific state. And when any change is made to that state, it tries to uh, validate the application-specific logic. And we have a remote interface. Uh, so if uh, you have the option to use uh, the Peru node in two ways, one, you can directly import it as a Go package, it's the first implementation is in Golang. And you can use the package directly from the use app specific API, or you can just run the Peru node uh, in as a, uh, like a daemon software and then interact it with a remote interface. 
so in the demo i will be showing uh, both these ways how to use pair node in both of these ways and also point you to resources where you can try it out on your uh, local setups yeah one addition here which which i forget to mention is that you cannot just send payments as mano hinted you can also uh, uh, impose arbitrary transaction logic so you can also play a game on depending on the on the outcome of the game that is played off chain uh, payments will be done. So there's arbitrary uh, transaction logic possible on the off-chain layer as well. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and that is something we currently support. So I will also show you later after the demo uh, through the, when the, during the code interview, how you can actually uh, plug in your uh, logic without modifying any kind of pair own or blockchain specific code. Uh, so in the demo, uh, I will present uh, four splits of the screen. So bottom two splits will be Alice and Bob respectively. And in the top split, we will have blockchain on one side and then we will have Peron node on the other side. Uh, so now I'll present my uh, demo screen. Uh, so as I said, we will uh, start a Peron node here in the screen. And then we will start a blockchain node here. So I'm using Ganache CLI node uh, just for demo purpose. So yeah, so we have the Ganache CLA node here. So once we start the node, I think we should deploy the contract once. So this deployment is uh, done at once, only once. So if you're uh, so if you're using a public blockchain, then the contract will already be deployed and this is a singleton instance. So what you will uh, basically do is always use that contract. But since we are using a local setup, I used to deploy for the first time. So here's the connect screen uh, where uh, this client is completely independent of Peron node. So this actually interacts with it only through a remote interface. And uh, now I'm connecting to the node from both these clients, which will uh, set up the key handling and the identity provider and everything for uh, these two clients, and then present us with a screen where we can do some transactions. Yeah, so if you look at the screen uh, on the top, we have the address or on chain address of the user. And uh, then we also have the on chain balance. So it's currently 99.94 ethers because we some ethers for you was used for uh, uh, sending the contracts. And then we have the time. So this time we will use it as a reference uh, later. Uh, so in the command box, you can type whatever command, for example, uh, as actually the auto supported commands are provided as placeholder text in the command box. So first we can open a channel uh, with Alice with say initial balance of 10 and 20. So you can see that both of them got a notification. So here it says it's waiting for peer and here it says it's waiting for user and it's blinking. So I can accept this uh, channel. What you can see is that once I accept there are uh, two on-chain transactions that are created. So one each for each party. So one transaction is for funding of Alice and other is for funding of Bob. So once the channels are funded, uh, they move to the transact phase and uh, the balance of these parties are shown here. We will open just one more channel so that I can uh, show demo easier way. Open with Alice another channel with five and six of initial balance and I will accept this channel as well. So once the channel is accepted, we have two, two channels in the transact phase. So to send payments, we can use uh, send API. So send uh, on channel number one, uh, say one, two ethers, and we can also request instead of sending, like uh, getting money from the other user. So request on channel number two, uh, three ethers. So then I can accept or reject. So I will accept one of the requests and I will reject the other one. So you saw that once I accept the transaction, uh, the status is marked as accepted for both parties. And then the, uh, current is the uh, proposed balance is made as the current balance. But when I reject, uh, that state just remains for the user to be shown. But uh, you can see that the latest state remains the older state itself and the version is zero. The other thing is that if you, you can also like uh, not choose not to respond. For example, I'm sending on channel one to Bob, uh, say point to ethers. And you can see that there's a timeout uh, in the uh, second field which says 14.26.11. So we will wait until the timeout expires. 
So then uh, you can see that uh, it will also be said that peer has rejected. So uh, this timeout is flexible. We can set any timeout like from seconds to minutes to hours, depending on the use case. And if the other user is not responding within the timeout, which happens in this case, then uh, the channel will, the party who sent will recognize that the peer has rejected because he has chosen not to respond. So this way you can actually make a large number of transactions. I think since we are using a GUI, uh, it is uh, very like, it is limited on how fast we can enter the transactions. But if you use a code to interact uh, with the Peru node and make these transactions, then you can like make thousands of transactions per second. So once we have made the transactions uh, and we want to close the channel, we can say, I want to close channel number one. So once I issue the close command, uh, the other party receives a special update. So I will just accept the update and then explain you what's happening. So in that special update, you can see that the version is marked as 2F. So F means uh, final. So the final update implies that uh, the other party has close, uh, chosen to close the channel and he has asked uh, Alice to agree if that channel can be closed on the blockchain as the final state. The advantage is that if we uh, if I agree to that state, then the blockchain understands all the involved parties have agreed that what the final state of the channel should be, and it allows the channel to be directly uh, closed. If you see in the first slide, we had four phases, open, transact, register, and settle. If we agree to the final state, then the final state can directly be registered on the blockchain without waiting for a time period. So it was very fast. Like we can see how it happens if we don't agree. I will close channel two. And in this case, I will reject the update. I don't agree it. So when I reject, you can see uh, that it's waiting for a timeout to expire. So the idea of this timeout is that uh, once we want to close a channel and one party, both parties have not agreed what is the final state of the channel, any one party can directly post the latest state to the blockchain. And the blockchain will provide a timeout duration for both parties. It will say that is a fixed time. In this case, it is 10 seconds, but we can make it also into days or hours. For this amount of time, you can wait. And if any other party has the latest state that the first party is misbehaving or posting older state, then you can challenge the registered state on the blockchain. And that challenge will be handled by the smart contract. So once that state expires, then uh, the channel will be settled and the balances will be withdrawn. So that is a difference you can see that the second channel was uh, settled with a newer state 2F, but the first channel was settled with the actual state, which is zero. So I think uh, this is the end of the demo. So this uh, tool we have published in our code repository. We also have a readme, so you can uh, check out uh, our project and try it on your systems as well. Now moving to the demo part. So in this part, uh, you saw that uh, uh, we had a GUI where we did this demo in which we were using a remote uh, gRPC interface. As I explained to you before, we have a session uh, which uh, handles uh, state channels in a very generic way. And in top of that, we build applications. So that you can find in the app directory. And uh, so this is a payment app that we have currently now. And for example, you want to say send payment. So uh, say, for example, you want to open payment channel. So the only thing the what app does is that it uh, gets the user data and then translate it into the uh, generic data, which the uh, session API expects, and then uh, sends the request. So it is a very simple logic and a very lightweight layer. So if you have any arbitrary logic that you want to implement, all you want to do is that you can add a simple app here. And this should be like very few lines of code. And it involves only your logic, nothing more than that. And rest of all is handled by the core abstractions. So you can see this app is very uh, lightweight and a very simple logic one. So this way you can actually implement uh, things. And you also have a example that we have described. So you can find it as payment underscore test. So in this uh, example, we have uh, uh, described how to use the app API directly without running a node. So you can just import this package and use it. So that you can actually try it out and you can run this on your system as well. For example, I will run it now. So here we will start a Ganache CLA node. I will just close this one. And then in this, we will run the uh, test. So what uh, this test does is that it actually does what we just uh, tried out in the GUI, but in a scripted way. 
so it will uh, open a session for both alice and bob and then it will uh, open a channel between them and transact on the ch- transact on the channel and then close the channel yeah so these two transactions are corresponding to the uh, deployment of contracts now it is in the setup phase yeah now we have alice session is open yeah now we have session for bob and uh, alice and bob have opened the channel they have made one transaction so you can see the updated balances here then they have registered uh, to the blockchain and closed uh, so you can if you want to develop any app then you can just uh, copy the payment app to uh, in the uh, app folder and then modify the logic and then try the test on the system and then integrate it with other systems that you want to use yeah so the second abstraction is the uh, remote interface that you saw on the previous slide so this app is uh, just a code way and then you have an api uh, package in which we have currently implemented the grpc interface and this is also a very lightweight layer so what this does is that it uh, for example we will again see the open uh, payment channel api how it is so what this does is that it just calls the app api as you can see here with uh, two to three lines of code just call the api check the error and that's all you need not do anything more and then package it according to your remote api interface for example here i am packaging it according to the grpc interface so uh, by having uh, these two lightweight layers it allows us to implement a large number of arbitrary app logics uh, on a very uh, abstract core framework that we have designed so this way it is very extensible for a large number of use cases uh, so coming back to the slide uh, we are at the end of the presentation uh to sum it up uh, i think uh, we uh, showed uh, how uh, the mod the sdk and the node are designed in modular ways and uh, some of the features that we are planning to come up with our uh, additional blockchain backends support for some other blockchains a uh, second is ability to do cross chain transactions this is a work in progress and third is uh, the light node or library for embedded devices so what you saw was that in the previous slide if you looked here the car and the charger might uh, be in a remote area for example if uh, the uh, charger will be a stationary thing and it might always have connectivity to the cloud so it can uh, always listen to blockchain and everything but the car might not be the case so what we do is that we want to split the parent software into two pieces one is the transacting piece which is using only the transaction phase and put it into the car and then the remaining piece the, the for the funding or for the uh, registering phase put it in the cloud so then the car can contact the cloud for funding the channel or for watching for changes in the channel but the transaction alone it can do directly with whichever party it wants and this is one of the interesting uh, approaches if we look at uh, enterprise use cases for example uh, fleet management etc uh, because if you're having a fleet of 1000 cars then there is no need to uh, put money store money in every car's wallet you can always use the funding and registering in the cloud and you can just give the car the access to transact off chain which also is a better security uh, so that brings us to the end of presentation and in general uh, this is an open source uh, project that we have hosted under uh, hyperledger labs um, so you we welcome uh, everyone who is interested to participate in the project and uh, start contributing in terms of using the project is a great contribution in itself and you can also start getting involved and i think we have we are open to question and answers now yeah okay thank you uh okay, so uh, i i have uh, some some question so i think this uh, project being used in so many any boss applications in the maybe manufacturing process in iot with iot or it just the kind of kind of puc kind of uh, uh, open source project uh, what is the status actually yes so this project itself is completely independent it is not relating to any internal bosch component but we are using it in uh, some of the uh, our research showcases so there is a project uh, a research project in germany called arena 2030 so the idea of this project is that uh, you have a very advanced uh, shared shop floor where uh, different companies will have their machines 
and uh, this uh, machines uh, are uh, designed to not produce a single product but they can be configured to produce a variety of products so they have to interact with each other and make a large number of transactions and do a lot of contracts so in that context we want to use uh, we are using this pero node to uh, handle the contracting and transaction uh, transacting capabilities this will work along with other things for example each machine will have its own identity on an ssi network say uh, ssi is self sovereign identity so this will work in constellation with uh, the ssi networks and agent framework so the each machine can have also have software agents which will make decisions on behalf of it so this will plug into that uh, whole ecosystem and in that research showcase okay okay and uh, another question i think there is one question like can you please share the link for this project you just mentioned that's okay and another thing so uh, this parent channel is a uh, blockchain agnostic right so it only support the ethereum or it support the any hyperledger or any other projects too or it yes. is for only ethereum no in design it is completely blockchain agnostic as mathias explained the core logic is written in a way that it does not depend on any blockchains and currently it supports ethereum like you can try it out whatever demo i showed was based on ethereum blockchain but we are also working uh, right now we have started working on another blockchain backend and soon you can see support for the second backend as well which is non ethereum uh, backend it's not uh, you will soon see support yeah. so we are currently working on a uh, uh, yeah applying for grant for uh, implementing a polka dot backend and also um, yeah potential other backends are planned but it depends a bit uh, if we get funding for this and what are our priorities so nothing determined yet but polka dot is, is one of the interesting candidates and hyperledger fabric is something that we are also considering but uh, not sure how the funding situation there is so as a company we also need to basically look where we where we can get the uh, grants and and uh, have the development supported so this influences yep. our decision so one other aspect is that it depends on community interest if uh, there is somebody who is interested in using a particular blockchain backend with perun then uh, we can also consider implementing that Okay. So I have a question. Because yeah, yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, it was a nice presentation. Thank you. And uh, I wanted to know how is the reconciliation happening? Is it part of the uh, Piran framework, or is it the underlying uh, blockchain uh, reconciliation itself will work? Uh, yeah, reconciliation okay. in the sense, like if 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 there is a uh, any uh, transaction before accepting it, the Uh, other party disconnects or whatever the network disconnects or something like that actually yeah so what happens is that uh, for initial phase so when the both the parties want to open a channel they communicate with each other and only when they respond they agree to what the initial state of the channel should be then they contact with the blockchain so and deposit their particular amounts what they agreed and the initial state that uh, they agreed to the blockchain so once uh, this is done it's in a transact phase and in the transact phase it does not matter so if you have connection you can make transaction if the other party was not responding in the demo i showed one place where the transaction expired so you can consider that case where the connection has been lost so you sent a transaction to the other party but the connection is lost in this case what you can do is that you can speak outside of the system to the other party to say, tell him to come on back, come back online and then respond to this transaction but if that is not possible if that is not at all possible then what you can do is that you still have the latest state which is agreed the previous state that state you can post to the blockchain without even talking to other party so when you post that state to the blockchain what happens is that blockchain will uh, uh, register the state as the state that is to be settled and then wait for a timeout so this timeout provides a window for the other party to come and check the online check the blockchain uh, whether uh, older state or other malicious state for example they have transacted three states and if uh, alice is posting a uh, second state which is actually a uh, malicious behavior uh, then bob can uh, during the waiting period come online check that an older state was posted and then post the latest agreed state which is 3 and then blockchain will see that which is the latest state based on version numbers because version numbers are monotonically increasing so based on that it will resolve uh, what is the latest state and then settle that state so this uh, dispute handling happens on the blockchain Oh, it is not the pre-run framework. It is basically the underlying blockchain itself will handle it. No, that is happens in the uh, pre-run contracts on the blockchain framework. So, uh, blockchain framework has two parts. 
one is the sdk that is running uh, providing you a way to interact with the blockchain and an sdk that is allowing you to transact with the other party the second component is the smart contracts that reside on the blockchain and whatever when i say i am talking to blockchain it means i am talking to these perun smart contracts okay yeah and basically the framework is i'm sorry yeah uh, basically yeah so the the last resort is is going to the blockchain so when you're not able to resolve and the framework is try is helping you in in uh, the first approach would be you resolve the uh, the current state off chain that means you send a state and you get a assigned update and the state is agreed but if the other party is not responding off chain mm -hmm. yeah. then you would tell the framework now you have to go on chain and the framework does that for you but there oh. uh, you basically have to decide as a user when is the moment when you want to go on chain and uh, so you are adding an extra logic on the framework itself to do to resolve the initial conflict is what you're trying to tell me yes yeah, yeah it's pretty simple i mean in yeah yeah fine you fine, propose fine. A, it you propose an update and either you get a response and if you don't get a response you will notice it and then you have to decision ah. do you want to basically dispute that now yes or do you maybe try to update again that's that's up to you yeah and, and the dispute uh, process will be will be done for by the framework for you so register the state and okay. then uh, uh, the framework will wait for a bit and then you can uh, okay. settle the state so what is the uh, uh, condition on which the framework will uh, transfer the dispute to the underneath blockchain uh, yeah sorry was i audible yeah you're audible yeah. so the condition is that uh, so when you want to close the state so uh, all this dispute resolution and everything happens only when you want to close the state so in the demo i showed that we can transact for n number of times but once we decide we want to close we just send a close command which actually instructs uh, the framework that uh, you have to close the channel and the first thing the framework will try is to send a closing update to other party which you show with the f symbol which has to actually says that the state is final and if the party is responding in the time period then it acts with that state like it directly settles but if the framework sees that the other party is not responding or he is missing then it automatically goes for settling the channel on chain like mm. with register and then waiting out for the time period and then closing okay that okay. is one part so the second part is that on the other parties uh, side also one core requirement uh, for the perun protocol to work is that the parties a perun node should be running at all times because if you are not watching the blockchain at all times then you are at risk because uh, when this dispute resolution is happening your blockchain your perun node should be watching so okay. your perun node keeps watching on the back end and when it is watches that a wrong state is registered it is not intimating the user it will just go and dispute the wrong state because there is nothing the user should tell the perun framework already knows that if uh, a uh, uh. bad state is interesting done, it should resolve okay i am totally with you guys what you told me now but why have this reconciliation on two levels why not have only on one level because if let's say if the framework was not able to resolve let's abandon it there and there why why do you want to give another chance to the underneath blockchain or in 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 other case if the framework is not able to uh, why 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 not give the uh, condition to only the underneath blockchain to resolve it and then bring it back to framework why are you doing double checking is my uh, next question yeah sure that is a very good question so the reason why we are uh, trying to finalize the state of chain and uh, then registering on blockchain is that Uh, that is to save uh, both uh, cost and time so okay. when you are so if you see the actual dispute resolution logic we register we assume we are not uh, agreeing any off chain uh, final state we just register to the blockchain in that case what we have to do is that first we have to register so that involves one blockchain transaction okay. second we have to wait for a time period so this window provides all other participants to see if the registered state was final and dispute if there is there is not final so okay. that window period is there third once the window period expires we have to settle the channel so that is second blockchain call so here we have two blockchain calls and one large uh, time window but if we agree to the uh, final state on the blockchain on the off chain then uh, we can do away with this we can directly settle the channel because both the yes. parties have agreed offline and they, we also don't have the window because these parties have agreed so it is an optimization okay, we have reduced gotcha. time and we have reduced cost okay got gotcha. you thank you thank you yeah thank you thank you It was a very good question thank you 
मंजरी राइट और या आई थिंक वी हैव वन हैंड्स अप फ्रॉम मंजरी नंदक कुमार सॉरी या दिस इज अ क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम बैंकटा वेयर विल दिस रिकॉर्डिंग बी अवेलेबल ओके दैट विल बी अवेलेबल ऑन द हाइपर लेजर यूट्यूब चैनल हेलो कैन यू हियर मी या yeah okay yeah sorry so uh, i have like four questions so let me uh, start so the first question is about the motivation you have so um, can you explain me the performance you you got after implementing this perun uh, protocol okay so we haven't yeah. uh, deployed it to our actual use case but okay. uh, if, if you just run the tests on your system you can see that uh, your transactions are like the order of thousands or uh, maybe mm -hmm. 10000 per second also it really depends only the only restricting factor is how fast you can communicate with the party and how fast you can make signatures only that is the time constraint there is no other uh, mm -hmm. time component involved mm -hmm. and uh, i mean can can you uh, did you do something like uh, how many offline transactions per minute is possible for the perun node to handle something like that did you do something yeah, related think, to performance uh, i think we have some tests uh, but not in a real scenario maybe uh, in mm -hmm. test scenario i think uh, we had uh, thousands to thousands of transactions per second mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. if you are yeah so we had, uh, let's see so actually I don't have specific performance tests on a large scale system but we have uh, mm -hmm. performance tests on a Raspberry Pi and even there you get over 50 transactions per second. So mm -hmm. um, okay. and I think what we have seen on larger devices with with other tests that you can do 1000 signatures or more per second. So if you take this number and translate it to the general setup Uh, so definitely on a larger system than a raspberry pi mm -hmm. you definitely get more and i would expect in the realm of 1000 transactions per second but it's a good point we we should actually verify that once again and maybe some of my colleagues have done that and i'm not aware of that um, mm -hmm. okay. that yeah. that is a number that we've seen in 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 some scenarios where signatures were involved and where basically yeah which which gives you an idea how many signatures you you can generate and this is mm -hmm. what we think is the performance bottleneck and the uh, communication round trip and what so is the underlying uh, signature scheme you are using is it like just, ethereum or it's something yeah exactly yeah it's ecgsa yeah, like for, for this uh, for, demos we are using ethereum signatures itself for off chain uh, signs yes. okay yeah. okay so ecdsa basically you yeah, are using yeah. yes yeah. okay are you considering using some other signature schemes in the future uh, yeah it depends so one thing one advantage with using icdsa is that uh, when we want mm -hmm. to verify the signature so when we post the states go to a blockchain for register or open face then there mm -hmm. needs to be done signature verification also happens so mm -hmm. like verifying ethereum compliance signatures is much easier on chain in terms of both cost and implementation so we mm -hmm. are uh, sticking to it now but if the need arises that uh, by using some other signature scheme we get an advantage then it's quite possible okay and uh, as perun is working offline so how does the transaction validation happens offline yeah so the perun app so the perun node uh, as i showed you in the uh, previous uh, thing that we have mm -hmm. a core state channel uh, logic that are running session mm -hmm. and on top of that we have an app so this app is what uh, defines your logic so how you can uh, make the next state and everything is defined by in this app okay yeah, so and, perun node and, itself is not doing anything about the validation you mean no in the perun node there are different components one component is where mm -hmm. uh, so in the perun node the app component is responsible for doing all this validation okay and it can be uh, modified you mean yes so it can be it can be modified we can make any kind okay. of apps okay 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 and okay the second question is uh, how does the light clients trust the perun node basically yes that that's a very good question uh, so the light clients uh, are not usable in all use cases so if you look at the previous use case that i was talking about for example of mm -hmm. fleet management or platooning 
uh, these are very industry specific or industrial iot uh, issue use cases where a company mm-hmm. has a large number of uh, devices or assets under its control and it wants uh, each of the asset to have its own transaction capability with other devices and in this scenario you can see that uh, there is always no reason for the devices to trust its company's uh, designated person so yeah. we can use some identity logic say self sovereign identity such certificates to designate mm-hmm. whom it should trust and then mm-hmm. we can establish that trust environment so that is how okay. we actually see that the light nodes can trust the funding and the watching nodes which interact with the blockchain in actual mm-hmm. uh, because further, mm-hmm. yeah yeah go ahead in the further step we are currently looking into the scenario where the light client doesn't uh, trust the node and this would be something like a web browser which doesn't trust the server to mm-hmm. uh, yeah. basically you want to keep the keys with the client in the in the browser wallet and there uh, you would need a uh, basically you can still do that but then you uh, the node should do a callback a signature callback to the client so whenever the node will need the signature it will not have the keys for that but it mm-hmm. will ask uh, the client to sign this on chain transaction so basically this then releases or removes this trust assumption on on the mm-hmm. node yeah yeah okay um and then the important question for the last is um you explained in the uh, first uh, the second slide saying that uh, scaling challenges right so how does and you are mentioning about industrial iot also so yeah. consider there is a smart factory or i don't know a smart city for example and there are iot devices installed across the city and they are sending data consider it as the data so they are sending continuous data to this blockchain network so i mean uh, implementing this scaling uh, solution as as a perun so um, do you already have that use case in mind or is it already developed i i, I don't know the status right now yeah. so yeah sure uh, with regarding uh, to your question i think one of the use case that we are uh, very focusedly working on is a mm-hmm. shared shop floor use case uh, mm-hmm. so that is uh, actually a, a huge uh, so it's a, it's a multi company project it's called i blockchain yeah. project uh, mm-hmm. so we yeah. also presented a talk before uh, you can I, i will present the link to this talk after this call so in that yeah, talk sure. we have explained about uh, that use case also in detail so there what mm-hmm. we try to do is that there are uh, different companies for example bosch is there daimler is there then uh, bmw is there and there are a lot mm-hmm. of uh, big companies and these big companies have big sh- shares in that shop floor like huge machineries and production lines mm-hmm. and uh, when some order comes in that is a very customized order <gasps> so this machines mm-hmm. will then uh, make contracts to each other that i will finish this component and give you at this point of time for this cost and all of this these things happen and mm-hmm. we have an agent framework a software agent for doing that and once mm-hmm. that is done uh, then uh, this transacting layer so making this contract and agreeing to what is the state and everything is implemented on this perun layer and mm-hmm. then uh, the actual big uh, production begins so once all the production is done and the payment happens again the perun layer is invoked and the payments all happen and it's resolved so that is one use case i think we are working on so you can uh, refer to that resource if you are like more mm-hmm. interested in the details of that use case Yeah. And, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Also, you can contact us through email. Uh, we can get in touch for further discussions too. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I was uh, considering the existing Ethereum, and there are light clients. So, we need this Perun in between, like a Perun node, to to make the system work for high volumes of transactions, right? So that's the. the motive i was also looking for like iot devices sensor data and how the underlying blockchain could handle i don't know thousands more than thousand requests per second or per minute so yeah exactly. because light client light client is completely dependent on the full node and full node suppose the full node has like only 50% of its capability to handle the light clients so that's kind of a performance issue also you know it can yes. drop a light client or it can just don't serve serve the request coming from the light client so uh, that was a basic issue yeah you refer to the uh, ethereum light client or yeah ethereum light client okay yeah, okay yeah i think that is exactly the place we are looking at and that is also the reason we keep the framework in a very flexible way for mm-hmm. example if you are having a more powerful device say a little more powerful than raspberry pi 
then you mm -hmm. can actually uh, run the peru node also like you can just import this go package and then directly run the peru node so you don't have a node to interact with you can just use the peru package so but if you're having a very constricted device say your smartwatch which is very less capable mm -hmm. yeah. then you yeah. can run it run the node on your smartphone and then mm -hmm. your uh, very transacting client on your smartwatch and then you can make mm -hmm. them interact via say bluetooth for like mm -hmm. funding and resolving or something like that mm -hmm. you can it supports all of the, those fancy constellations so that is the uh, thing we are looking at when we are designing this framework okay yeah yeah i mean sounds sounds good and uh, looks like there is a lot of um, things that could be possible to do in this scenarios yeah yeah yeah, yeah. thank you thank you thank you so much questions. it was very good thank you thank you so uh, any other question from uh, anyone else okay i think no so uh, just a question. You haven't shared the link of the project you mentioned uh, at last. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, can you please? Second. Yeah, thank I you. I can chat it on the uh, chat, and we can also push, uh, like post it back in the meetup uh, page as well. The links to yeah, the sure. Uh, sure. project and other resources that I was referring to, I can post all back into the meetup page. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so then uh, I think then we can wrap up, right? Yeah. So thank you, Manuranjit and uh, Mithyas, and thank you for the presentation. So uh, this uh, recording will be uploaded to the Hyperledger uh, YouTube channel, and share with, I will share the link on the India chapter page and even uh, to the community. OK, OK. Thank you very much for, for hosting us. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a really uh, uh, interesting discussions. and. Yeah, thanks for the thanks question. For question. That's right. Yeah. And yeah, yeah okay. contact us if you want more details or want to work with us or work with the product. If you have questions about uh, the framework, yeah, we are yeah, happy. The project you... link is on the screen, but we also share it as like uh, text links in the meetup page. Yeah.